Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me, Aliza? Perfect. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot um, to cover uh, during our hour together today. I just want to welcome everyone to our webinar on Washington State's new outdoor preschool pilot. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the Natural Start Alliance, which is a project of the North American Association for Environmental Education. My name is Christy Merrick. I'm very proud to be the director of uh, the Natural Start Alliance. And I am so happy to welcome um, Aliza Yair. <laughs> I have a slide about her. Uh, from the Washington State Department of Children, Youth and Families today. Uh, to share an update on the really exciting developments in outdoor education in Washington. And slide not advancing. So, slide here. And I'm going to go. Oh. Um, this fall, Washington became the first state in the U.S. to license outdoor preschools. It's a pilot program and has a whole nation watching what's going to happen. And in fact, we actually just recently shared on our Facebook page an article from India um, about this pilot. So no pressure, Eliza, but I think actually the whole world is watching. <laughs> Um, Aliza herself has taught in outdoor preschools in New Zealand. She has a master's in education from Harvard University. She was a policy specialist in New York City's Pre-K for All program before joining Washington State's Department of Children, Youth, and Families. She's a program specialist on the project and she helped develop the pilot licensing standards for outdoor preschools. So we're really grateful to Aliza for being here to um, update the nature-based environmental education communities about um, this really important project. Uh, just a quick note, um, all the lines are muted in this webinar, um, but we do really want you to participate with any questions or comments or resources, anything else that you'd like to share. So just use the chat button on the toolbar and you can specify if you want your message just to go to Aliza and our staff. Uh, or if you want to share your message with the whole group. So please do take advantage of that opportunity to type your questions in there. Um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of the webinar for Aliza to take some questions. So um, please do um, submit them. And we've already actually been receiving some questions through email. So we'll definitely have some questions to share with you, Aliza. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aliza. Bear with me for just a second while I stop sharing and Aliza takes over. Thanks, Christy. All right, everyone, I'm also going to start sharing my screen now. Okay. Christy, can I get a video of you and a thumbs up if you can see my... Okay, great. All right, everyone. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I uh, sincerely hope that today by sharing what we are doing in Washington, that this will um, educate or inspire uh, or empower you in whatever role that you have, whether you are an educator, uh, an advocate, or an administrator as well. Uh, my name is Aliza Yair, and as Christy mentioned, I am the Outdoor Preschool Pilots Program Specialist, and I work for the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families, also called DCYF, and I may refer to it as DCYF or the department uh, throughout this presentation. I am also going to start by encouraging us to acknowledge the ancestral native land that we are on. Um, I myself am on Puyallup tribal land uh, in Washington state. I live where that uh, little uh, yellow triangle is in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and I think it's really important that we start off um, 
recognizing the inherited history of settler colonialism uh, and oppression of Native people that uh, we have, uh, especially as it relates to our work in reconnecting people with the land, uh, because that also means reconnecting us with the people of the land that we are on. Uh, a little bit more about the Puyallup tribe. Um, they are really known to be very generous and welcoming uh, to all that come uh, to, their, to their home. And so in that spirit, uh, I hope that this presentation provides something uh, for you today as well. And if you are curious, the link to the website um, that I uh, found this on is uh, on the screen. So what's cooking in the mud kitchen today? Uh, so this has been a few years of work that we are now going to try and cover in less than 45 minutes so that we have time for questions. Uh, so what I'll talk to you about today is give you a pilot project overview and talk about the child care uh, and early learning laws and rules in Washington. Um, and we will <clears throat> pardon, also talk about uh, some of the specific outdoor preschool licensing standards uh, for Washington State, uh, some of our process for licensing outdoor preschools, um, as well as other work uh, which is related around setting teacher qualifications requirements. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, uh, but uh, you can uh, enter your questions at any time into the chat box and Christy will help us um, look through those later. So the pilot project overview. Uh, in 2017, Washington State Senate passed a bill uh, to uh, authorize the department uh, to have a pilot project to license outdoor preschools. Um, the legislature found that there were 40 outdoor preschools uh, currently operating in Washington privately um, and in a license exempt capacity, which I'll explain a bit more about later. But what that basically means is that these programs um, were limited in the amount of time that they could care for children in a day, and also that they were limited in accepting any sort of uh, state subsidies for uh, child care for low-income families. Um, so uh, there was enough research around the benefits of outdoor education and that uh, advocacy and lobbying was successful and you can read about it in a recent article um, written about that. Uh, and so the bill uh, authorized us with sort of two strands of goals. Uh, the first being around setting the standards for outdoor preschools, and the second being around exploring how outdoor preschools would fit into our existing systems. So to uh, set standards for outdoor preschools, the legislature asked that the department analyze the current models of outdoor preschools adapt, waive, or create licensing regulations when necessary to allow for the operation of outdoor preschools, uh, to establish also the health, safety, and best practices for early childhood environmental education in Washington, uh, which, you know, as a sort of emerging field means that we are participating in doing so for the rest of the country. In terms of incorporating outdoor preschools into our existing systems, uh, we are enabling outdoor programs to increase hours and receive subsidies, as I mentioned. Also exploring how outdoor preschools can participate in our quality rating and improvement system. This is also called a QRIS. Um, and in Washington, we call it early achievers. Some states it's called STARS. Um, some states have them, some states don't. Uh, but we do in Washington, uh, and also generally speaking, how to increase access to the outdoors and benefits to children and families. The timeline that the department then developed after being instructed by the legislature to do this 
um, in the first year was around uh, establishing the pilot project and developing the licensing standards. The second year is around working with programs to provide technical assistance. Um, and begin collecting data um, a little thinking a little bit like pre post, you know, looking at where some of the hot spots were for the programs that are participating in the pilot. And then in year three, uh, providing that pilot license to up to 10 sites uh, and then monitoring and collecting data on the community impact of that uh, the programs compliance with the licensing standards and uh, different child level data like injuries and incidences. Uh, we also are setting teacher qualification requirements and exploring uh, progression for early achievers. That's that QRIS I talked about, which are ongoing throughout these years. And next year, uh, the final report is due to legislature in November of 2020. Even though the pilot goes until August 2021, this is so that our legislature has time to review the information and make decisions uh, for going forward during their 2020-2021 uh, session. Um, and in that time, after they make a decision, then the department has a few months to prepare DCYF for licensing outdoor preschools more widespread, should that be the legislature's decision. So what are we going to be telling the legislature uh, for them to base their decision on? Uh, our report will answer the following questions. Uh, can the outdoor preschool model expand access to early learning programming? So we're looking at enrollments, wait lists, family surveys, and looking at cost. Um, one of the things, one of the challenges in Washington state is that we have uh, lack of space uh, in child care. The more people want access than we have child care programs. And so uh, providing an outdoor preschool program could help uh, people to provide that sort of service um, without needing a large initial financial investment into a facility. We're also looking at whether or not the outdoor preschool model uh, has aspects of quality so we mean quality in terms of like basic safety uh, of care. So that's injury and illness, uh, attendance, but then we're also uh, exploring different quality measures. And um, so I'm not going to go into this too much, but for those of you who know what these are, um, we're looking at Eckers 3 class and then the ERS 3i is a Washington specific model um, or measure uh, tool um, that is a kind of combination of those. Uh, so who is involved? Uh, we have in the pilot project an advisory group, uh, which is made up of directors of current outdoor preschool programs. This is including the 10 pilot sites, which we call our implementing group, as well as others who are not getting licensed, but who provide exemplary outdoor preschool programs in Washington. And so they advise. Um, they also provide a sort of baseline kind of observation group. Uh, the program types that we have involved are nature preschools. Um, so these are programs with an indoor facility whose outdoor space is um, more natural uh, or outdoor space is nature. Uh, and these may already be licensed. Uh, we also have some nature center based programs. These are educational institutions um, around a nature preserve. Uh, we also have some all outdoor programs, so no facilities at all, uh, but we do distinguish whether or not they are with or without a permanently located outdoor classroom. Um, you can see a picture of what a permanently located outdoor classroom might look like, um, but one without might also be known as like a roaming program or a zero impact program or a backpack program. Uh, we also are including in our licensing standards and process gardens and farming uh, and seeing what the health and safety standards around that uh, look like. So I'm going to give you a really brief uh, look at the child care licensing uh, laws and rules to give you some context. I think it's important that if you are wanting to figure out how your state might 
uh, licensed outdoor preschools, you have to think about what are the opportunities for uh, piloting things or uh, working you know, within your system because each state is going to be a little bit different. And so in Washington state, the licensing context is that the Department of Children, Youth and Families regulates a couple of different setting types, center-based childcare, family home-based childcare, and school-aged childcare. Uh, recently, like the year before the pilot started, uh, DCYF was also instructed by the legislature to align those standards, ensuring the same level of health and safety for children regardless of what setting they are in. So we have a mandate to have aligned licensing standards. Um, that is in, uh, we call uh, WAC, so Washington Administrative Code, in Chapter 110-300. Um, and you also may be wondering like, well, what is a license? And so uh, basically, you know, a license in Washington is what allows a program to provide care for more than four hours a day and to accept subsidies. Um, but it's also kind of like a stamp of, uh, you know, assurance for families that this is a safe and good uh, place for your child. Uh, they are young and vulnerable, as empowered and capable and competent as they are, um, and we need to ensure their safety. Um, so an agency is what, get, what gets licensed by DCYF, uh, but it's important to note in Washington what is not an agency. So an agency does not include things like relatives, legal guardians, families, friends and neighbors, or parents on a cooperative basis. These are all the carve-outs for who can operate basically a child care type of program without being titled like a child care. Uh, and these are inclusive of any program that is under four hours. So outdoor preschools have been existing in that, um, in that area within our laws um, for the, you know, in the past. So the pilot bill asks us to waive or adapt our licensing requirements. So that's that aligned standards for family home and center-based programs. So we're waiving or adapting them um, to allow for outdoor preschools to operate the same level of health and safety, uh, but maybe just in a different way. Um, this, I've actually talked about every piece of this slide, so I'm gonna just skip it. Um, and so within the bill, uh, they defined outdoor preschools as outdoor nature-based early learning and child care programs mean an agency offered program operated primarily outdoors in which children are enrolled on a regular basis for three or more hours per day. So this is what tells us who can be involved in the pilot project not necessarily what the definition for outdoor preschool program is going to be after the pilot. Um, you can see in here, we allow for three or more hours per day, but we still have that existing rule of who is not an agency as being programs under four hours a day. So these are some things that we're going to have to um, sort out uh, as we create like final legislation um, to authorize outdoor preschools within Washington State. Also, the term primarily, um, basically we take it just to mean more than half. Um, saying that a program is an outdoor preschool based on a percentage of the amount of time outside though is problematic because if you have a three hour program, that means that over one and a half hours of that day is outside, but if you are talking about an extended day uh, program to support working families, that's a 10 hour day. Um, and so then that after that program could, would have to have children outside for more than five hours a day uh, to be considered an outdoor preschool in this definition. So that's just something to keep in mind as you might write or advocate for legislation in your own uh, context. Um, and so the structure of the pilot 
program is that we have our laws, which are the revised code of Washington. That's the bill that authorized us to do the pilot. Then we have Washington administrative code. Uh, we filed a chapter called 300B, uh, which basically just outlines how somebody gets uh, outdoor preschool license. Um, the way that we're doing it in Washington is we are doing it through a contract that references the outdoor preschool pilot standards. Um, this is so that the outdoor preschool pilot standards can exist as um, rules that you have to adhere to, but that we don't yet have to file as Washington Administrative Code as that chapter 110300D. So this is just for the pilot project. Um, the contract basically says, and we call that the outdoor classroom agreement, that you'll have an outdoor classroom or uh, outdoor preschool program, uh, and you'll follow the outdoor preschool pilot standards. This also allows us to tell the federal government that all of our programs are compliant with things like background checks and um, staff training around particular things like medication. So some specifics about the outdoor preschool licensing standards. Uh, so we took our line standards for um, uh, family homes and childcare, and we kind of ran it through the outdoor preschool advisory group. We uh, every month sent a new section out uh, in survey format to get as much stakeholder feedback into uh, how those uh, standards of quality could be met or it can be met in an outdoor preschool setting. I also spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at best practices and research from across the globe, really. Um, and that is what has given us our outdoor preschool pilot standards. So while in a lot of ways these are um, like global, they are very much suited to the Washington context um, and aligning with both our weather here and also our expectations of other programs. And so some of the places that I looked for best practices and research, um, and this is to give you an idea as well um, that you can reference other um, authorized agencies uh, um, as well as uh, professionals with expertise. So the Natural Start Alliance Professional Practices, which was just released, but I've been involved with. So using the Natural Start Alliance community to support. Also looking at uh, organizations like Knowles and Outward Bound for their um, outdoor safety uh, practices and policies, looking at US Forest Service for campfire safety, leave no trace for setting policy around backcountry toileting. They have an MOU with like many state and all national parks to set that policy, so we follow them. Uh, specifically within Washington State, we also have the Department of Health, which provides uh, guidance on like uh, waterless uh, toileting options. So, like if you have a compost toilet, what that, uh, what safe practice is like for that. Um, and also Department of Agriculture, like if you want to have chickens or farms and, and collect eggs, or feed them to the kids, um, they set the standards for that and they are our experts on that. Um, but we also really took into account research into nature-based education for young children, particularly around risky play, uh, benefits and potential injury, and also um, nature education. So you can see some researchers there, although there are plenty and many. So what did we come up with? Well, I'm not going to go over all of the standards. Um, you can find those online and the link for that website will come up later. And um, it's just Washington Outdoor Preschool Pilot. Uh, but basically what we're saying is that if you're gonna be an outdoor preschool, there are some specialized standards, particularly staff have to have training, not just in early childhood education, but also in environmental education. This is not, technically defined yet for us. Um, so we're going to be defining that and I'll show you our process for that later. Uh, also, we have a smaller group size and ratios. Uh, so in a normal program, you can have 20 kids to two staff. 
uh, we do not deem that safe and we don't see any other programs uh, that do so around the world. Um, and that has not been the guidance that we've gotten. Um, and so that's not what we're doing. <laughs> uh, so we have a maximum group size of 16 and a ratio of one to six. And remember, this is for preschool age children. So this is for children uh, between two and a half and six years old. Um, so keeping that in mind. Uh, we also have a requirement uh, to have teaching focus on boundaries and self-regulation. Uh, we don't normally say that you have to teach any particular thing, perhaps other than like behavior uh, in our licensing standards, but for outdoor preschools, this is slightly different. Uh, we also are requiring benefit risk assessments, and I'll go into more detail about what that is. And we have specific expectations um, around policies or procedures for activities like tree climbing, tool use, or campfires, uh, specifically hygiene related things like toileting, hand washing, and eating in the outdoors. Um, and family engagement, so ensuring proper clothing, super necessary, uh, and uh, talking with families about the commitment to outdoors and environmental education. I'm going to take a drink now of water, hold on. <sighs> Thanks. Uh, so our approach uh, to child safety you know, when you think about what licensing standards for a facility or a playground are hoping to achieve, it's child safety, good development, and like a great education. Um, but when you are in nature, you can't control the environment in the same way. And so your approach to safety and child development is more process oriented uh, rather than uh, controlling the things in the space. Um, although you do still do a little bit of management around that. Uh, so we distinguish between hazard and risk uh, in our licensing standards. Uh, hazards is like no go, kids can't manage it, don't do it. Uh, risk is more a situation that could potentially have some injury around it if the child like falls or slips or something, but uh, also, when you're teaching the child, you know, generally speaking, you're a present adult with skills to help the child assess risk and, and move their body through a situation um, and their emotions through a situation. Um, and so in this context, risk is actually necessary to support healthy child development. Um, risky play, we take this uh, definition from Ellen Sanseder's uh, research on this. Um, but it's basically play that is thrilling and it, it clarifies some types of play that are considered risky play. And then the process of benefit risk assessment or risk benefit assessment, I've seen it called in other countries, um, where you identify the hazards, right, and mitigate the hazards and the risky play elements and you manage the risky play elements um, in order to help uh, support child safety and development. So we have a standard, it's 471 um, around outdoor preschool benefit risk assessments. And these slides are just to show that, you know, we ask for this process to be undertaken when you're selecting a site. Um, as the seasons change for risky play activities and to guide uh, your program and also us as licensors to understand what are we looking for when we come in to a program and we're monitoring for safety, how do we know that your tree climbing process is safe? Um, so we have your proposal, if you're a program, we have your proposal of what your policy is. We've signed off on that if we agree that it's safe. And then that's what we look for, for your teachers. Um, and we also ask for these benefit risk assessments to then inform policies and procedures around a number of different uh, nature specific um, things like encountering pets or wildlife, campfire activities, being near bodies of water, um, using public facilities, uh, foraging, um, or, and missing child protocols. Um, and 
you know, just to give an example, um, I like to use this one uh, in case people aren't quite sure yet what a benefit risk assessment is. Uh, so let's take tree climbing uh, in the Squaxin Forest. Uh, Squaxin Island is a tribe in Washington State. And so the risk of this activity, of this child being up in this tree root system, is that they're up high and they could fall. The roots are smooth and then the wet can be slippery. Um, there's also only room for one, so there could be conflict. But at the same time, there's benefits, right? Um, this child is comfortable up there, so they have that confidence and competence. Um, they practice and are now familiar with the root systems and the bark texture. And these are early science concepts as well. Um, and then also you can notice that some of the cedar has been harvested from the tree behind her. And so, you know, this child is, uh, you know, close and in, in touching distance really of a cultural practice. And so that's a real benefit. Um, but how you manage that is one teacher stands nearby to assist um, just in case, and uh, you might discuss the risk of slipping and need for time taking with children as part of that required teaching around risk assessment. And so that's your management plan and it would become a policy or procedure for your staff and they would have to be trained on it. Um, and this is how we ensure that process-based approach to safety. Um, and so what are some of the considerations with licensing outdoor preschools? You saw our standards, benefit risk assessments is a big part of that. Um, but additionally, you know, when we think about it as a department and in your context, your government officials are going to think about this too, is what is our liability, right? Because we are ensuring child safety, we're putting the government seal of approval on this program. Um, and so how do we make sure that things that we say keep children safe are happening? Uh, so programmatically, our teacher qualifications where we have uh, required training in environmental education and experience of two years in nature-based education, um, and that's for lead teachers, not uh, necessarily assistant teachers. Um, having that site-specific, site-specific policies based on benefit risk assessment, um, and also site-specific extreme weather emergency plans and our specific requirements for campfires, water supervision, and missing children protocols. Those are things that we have deemed as a department really high risk, um, or even our attorney general's office have deemed as high risk. And so we've added um, detailed expectations around how those things must go. Uh, and additionally, in terms of liability legally, you know, the pilot project is voluntary. Um, and even asking uh, for a license, generally speaking, is voluntary. You don't have to be an early childhood uh, program. You can do something else. Uh, so there is that aspect of it. You know, you're entering into an agreement. You agree to follow the rules by receiving that license and applying for that license. And um, we also do have a risk waiver for parents to sign. So parents have to sign off on all sorts of things uh, when you're licensed, you know, like your enrollment policy, payment. Um, and so for outdoor preschools, in addition to that, um, is letting them know like these are the risks of our program. These are the ways that we address these risks, like sign here. Uh, we also require a land use agreement. So whether you're on private or public land, uh, private land, you need permission of the owner of that land. And if you're public, you need permission from the land manager. So it really depends if you're a municipal, state, or a national park land use, who that might be. Um, and you also need uh, program insurance. In terms of licensing uh, and monitoring and practice, so when we give you a license in Washington State and actually generally probably throughout the country because it's a federal requirement, um, we come in and monitor at least once a year in an unannounced visit to make sure things are going uh, as they should. Uh, and so our process is really very similar um, to a childcare center or to a outdoor preschool program. We just speak it to fit outside. 
So we have our specialized standards. Our applications are a little bit tweaked. Um, so instead of having an address with a map with the blueprint um, of your facility, you have to have a map uh, with the boundaries kind of, of where you want to have your program uh, and also and your meeting locations where your bathrooms are. Um, pretty much anywhere we can try and find you um, needs to be on that map uh, so that we can find you. Uh, also with our licensing staff, usually one person is assigned to a program, but for outdoor preschools, we are assigning two. Um, this is because you do really need to develop some familiarity with, uh, with that location and that specific program. Um, and it does re require of our licensing staff a particular like physical ability. So if you hurt your leg or something, um, you would need to have your backup licensor uh, go out on visits or uh, respond to a complaint if something came up. Um, our data collection systems are also a little bit tweaked. Uh, so, you know, when we're out in the field, uh, we're not using tablets necessarily. We'll have paper, we'll have laminated paper. Um, uh, we're currently using just Excel because we haven't input uh, everyone. Uh, we haven't input outdoor preschools into our full uh, Washington State licensing uh, systems, like software systems. Um, but so those are just some things that we're doing to make it work um, at first as a pilot. So maybe in your context, you know, you might have to make those little adjustments too. Um, and our licensing and monitoring cycles only are just a little bit uh, more condensed because we're trying to gather data for our report. Um, but in regular licensing, it would be a little bit more split up uh, over time. In terms of our staff, like who are our licensors? Um, you do need specialized licensing staff, A, to learn the rules, but also um, to have a sense of value of outdoor nature-based play. Um, you are going to be out there in the rain, in the sun, getting dirty, um, and so uh, just you as a staff person, you know, that is part of your job expectation. Um, and so that needs to be a fit for you. Um, as well, uh, you need to have uh, specific training. Uh, you know, what is a benefit risk assessment? How do I assess a benefit risk assessment uh, in order to say whether or not that's a good one or a bad one? And um, so we're working on developing a lot of that guidance for licensing staff now as well. Um, and particularly uh, if the legislature decides that outdoor preschools are going to be a full on thing in Washington, then we'll be ramping up a lot of that to prepare DCYF for full licensing. And you also need specific gear, uh, you know, raincoats, boots, no shoes, whatever that is. Uh, I mean, I know what that is, but like whatever you need. Um, and those waterproof data gathering systems. At least in Washington, we get a lot of rain. So our pilot, uh, our progress so far, uh, we are in year three. So we are providing licenses at this point. We have five licensed outdoor preschool programs. So these have met all initial licensing requirements, um, began licensing in September. Uh, two of these uh, five are a blended center outdoor preschool model. So what that means is they have a facility that let's say can have 24 children in it. And then by licensing the outdoor area nearby, they can now care for 12 more children. Um, but those children have an opportunity to come inside for part of the day while another group of children goes outside into that space. So you're never putting too many children in a building, um, but you have expanded your capacity and uh, your community's access to quality childcare um, by licensing your outdoor program. Uh, the other three are fully outdoors with no facility. And then we have five more programs receiving support for their application. Um, and so I'm going to finish just on a little note around teacher qualification requirements because 
in uh, the United States, this is not standardized, early childhood environmental education teaching requirements. Um, but a lot of work over the past, you know, 20, 30 years has been put into studying uh, early childhood education requirements like CBAs, we have NAUIC with accreditations, et cetera. And so uh, in Washington state, like we're, we're keeping it Washington specific uh, because we need to incorporate things into our current systems, including our workforce development systems. Um, so we have a working group with the following goals that we are going to establish those professional competencies uh, for nature-based early childhood educators um, and that this connects to our early care and education core competencies, which is a document that guides our workforce development throughout the state already. And um, so this is going to be a supplemental document and it can be used um, for teachers that will be prepared to go into any setting. Uh, so in that way, kind of getting uh, the benefits of nature-based education out into other uh, types of child care in Washington as well. Um, we'll then use that, uh, uh, the competencies that we've set to determine our pre-service training requirements. So, you know, um, you might have to take a nature-based education course uh, through a college or through professional development or through a private institution. Um, but as long as that course uh, meets these particular competencies, then we can say that's good, that's an equivalent to this requirement, whatever that might be. Um, and then, you know, all of this work that we're doing um, is ultimately building Washington's capacity to provide uh, teacher training um, for nature-based education and environmental education, regardless of where those teachers go on to work. So to give you a sense of some of the members of that working group, because I think it's really important as you think about building coalitions to advance the uh, cause of early childhood environmental education in your area, uh, you know, you need to think about who are your partners and uh, experts. So in our working group, we have faculty from universities and colleges who focus on early childhood teacher preparation. Um, and specifically members of the Early Childhood Teacher Preparation Council. That's a collection of uh, faculty from colleges across the state. We also have uh, leaders and staff of some of those independent environmental education teacher training institutions. Um, in Washington, we have a couple. We're very lucky in that regard. Um, we have also the directors and the staff of our outdoor preschools. So this is kind of part of our advisory group work. Um, we've also invited in experts in child development, uh, outdoor and environmental education from K-12. So we want to keep aligned um, to the expectations as children move into school as well. Um, various uh, DCYF staff, so like myself, people involved in professional development with the department. And we also have tribal representatives who are experts in early childhood education and their tribal uh, in their tribes. Um, and so our workforce training structure that we are working towards um, is we're thinking, you know, that there are kind of two types of environmental education competencies. One is around outdoor safety and risk management. Um, and the other is around nature-based education. So like what do you do with the nature? Um, and they are related, there's some crossover. Um, but some of the outdoor safety and risk management are things as, um, you know, uh, clear cut as like, what is a poisonous mushroom, um, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, and so then we are also thinking of uh, the delivery methods of this type of uh, training um, as we might develop as a department or through a partner, um, the safety and risk management pre-service requirement. So this is like, the things you have to know before you even start working in an outdoor preschool if you're getting a license. Um, and then we call that child care basics in Washington state. So there would be an outdoor preschool kind of component to that. Other things in child care basics are like emergency management, medication administration, 
um, bloodborne pathogens training. Um, so lots of the things that the federal government requires of anyone working in early learning at all. Um, and then, you know, trying to set up our state to support nature-based pedagogy um, in professional development and qualifications, but that would be done through partner organizations like universities, colleges, et cetera. Our timeline for this, um, we started this really last year or this past year. Um, in June, we brought together this working group to create a shared understanding of the goals of nature-based education for children started brainstorming some of the competencies to achieve those goals. Um, in October, we uh, separated those out into different sections and then also established levels. So is this a level one, like entry level uh, competency, like you should be able to do this if you're hired, um, all the way up to a sort of master's level competency, like if you're going to have a graduate degree in early childhood environmental education, you should be able to do this. Um, and so then next year, we're going to take this document and start applying that to the trainings that are on offer and the trainings that we might develop. So if you want more information after this today, um, the website is up there. We have some legislative reports. You can see the uh, 110-300-D WAC uh, linked through there, and our classroom agreement and the outdoor preschool pilot standards there. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Christy. Thanks, Aliza. I really I so appreciate you um, going through this. And it's really, you've been so thorough. Uh, we had so many questions come in ahead of um, the webinar. And incredibly, you answered almost all of them <laughs> with that overview. So that was really um, fantastic. And please know, I just really want you to um, feel all the support that is coming to you and your colleagues from all across the US. Um, we're really grateful to you for taking this step. We know it was not easy and you've been so thoughtful and just done such an incredible job. I really feel like I'm working with a really wonderful group of people there to come up with some standards that really look very appropriate. And um, I know a lot of people were worried, what could this look like? And I think that you have really um, set the bar high for everyone. So thank you so much for your... Yeah, well, it's public. Feel free to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that there many states are, are already working on that. Um, so um, I do have a few questions for you, but um, before we jump into those, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of resources from Natural Start that I think will be helpful to folks um, uh, if they're thinking about doing this kind of work. And for some reason, I don't know why. It's not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, so the first that I just wanted to mention quickly, uh, our current feature story on the Natural Start website uh, is written by Kit Harrington, and she's the former director of the Fiddleheads Forest School in Seattle, Washington, and she was also one of the founders of the Washington Nature Preschool Association. And her story really um, explores a lot of the behind the scenes of getting to uh, the legislation and getting the legislation passed. Um, and she offers some takeaways for um, anybody who's working on the sort of policy advocacy side uh, of trying to get um, legislation like this passed. So I encourage you to take a look at that. We were um, trying to, between the webinar and this feature story, give people a kind of well-rounded look at what's happened in Washington. Um, the second resource that I just wanted to highlight quickly is the Nature-Based Preschool Professional Practice Guidebook that Natural Start just recently published. It provides a very high-level view, I think, of um, the practice of nature-based education, particularly in the United States, in terms of um, those programs teaching, their environments, safety practices, and um, program administration. So I think together with um, the specific 
um, pilot licensing standards from Washington for the outdoor preschools. Um, they provide a really good set of resources for programs to think about if you want to know about nature-based education in general and outdoor education for young children, advocate for it. Um, I think that the two pieces together are really powerful. And I think you'll see as I, as I was listening to you, Lisa, I saw so many um, connections between the two, so <clears throat> which is a good sign. I think we were both on the right track. Uh, and then lastly, um, I just want to encourage everyone to um, think about continuing this conversation within our sort of professional community um, at Natural Start Nature-Based Early Learning Conference. Um, we'll be in Cincinnati uh, at the end of July. Um, and the focus of this year's conference will be on advocacy um, and how we tell the story of um, the power of nature-based education in order to really change education more broadly. Um, and the call for proposals just went out today. Um, so I really encourage everyone who's here to think about um, submitting a, a proposal and think about joining us there to keep this conversation uh, going. Uh, so with that, speaking of keeping the conversation going, um, we've gotten a lot of questions, uh, but the first one is um, really for those states who are thinking about doing some work like uh, what you've been doing there, um, they might be concerned about whether money will be a barrier. Um, can you share a little bit about um, sort of the budget side? Is it an expensive undertaking? Uh, are they likely to find that, um, that, that the cost of doing a pilot like this could be a barrier? Sure. Um, well, I'll start by saying that um, really a lot of the time that it's taken, uh, you might be able to avoid now that you do have those resources of the professional practices and the standards that we've developed. Um, so that will help. Um, the budget for this pilot is basically the cost of, of one and a half FTEs or full-time employees. So it pays for me and it pays for half of the time of a licensing specialist um, who is the program manager. So she kind of helps run a lot of the back-end licensing bureaucracy um, development issues. And, um, and it also pays for us to bring together our advisory group and our working group um, but other than that, we don't provide any um, money to the programs that are participating in the pilot. Um, that is something that is definitely worth remembering if you're a program wanting to advocate is that you might have to do a lot of work for free um, to help get it off the ground. Uh, yeah, and so your budget will depend on how much your state pays their state employees <laughs> as well. <laughs> Hopefully they're paid well. Yeah. And um, and educators should be. Great. Who knows? That's, yeah. That's super helpful. Um, we also uh, received a number of questions around um, professional training for educators um, that are working in uh, outdoor preschools. It's something that we also think a lot about at Natural Start. I think the whole field is starting to really think a lot more deeply about preparing uh, our workforce for work in outdoor settings. It is um, it has a lot that's similar to traditional um, early child education, but uh, you know, as you talked about, there are also some specific areas that people need to be ready for. Um, but I thought it was interesting, and several others I noticed that was interesting, that you also talked about um, the professional training for licensors, mm. which was really cool. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering if you can elaborate. You mentioned specifically on the slide, but we didn't get into a detail about that uh, boot camp. Yeah. Licensors, could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I just put together like a day long training for licensors that I call boot camp um, because it's just like a, we're going for it. Um, and I am happy to share that with people. Um, some of it is uh, general, um, but uh, more than half of it is specific to Washington. So. You can use it as like an outline perhaps, um, but basically it's like introducing 
what is nature-based education uh, to the licensors. Um, you know, I have it right next to me, but it'll take too long to find it. <laughs> um, uh, but so it's that, and uh, then going through the different standards that are specialized for outdoor preschools, talking them through, um, also providing information on risky play, a lot of the information about the benefits of outdoor preschool, um, and going through like a benefit risk assessment, what is that? Um, so it's a very jam-packed day, uh, and we also held it at a nature center that has an outdoor preschool program. And so part of our day was also going and observing a program in action. Fantastic. Um, we've had several, uh, you mentioned that you'd be happy to share details around this. And we've had, I noticed um, a number of questions around whether we'll share these resources, whether people can see these slides, and I just wanted to uh, emphasize that we can make all of this available to everyone. Um, and I'll show you a slide too that you can see the webinar again. Um, so if you, if that's something that you might want to add, you can share. I'm sorry, say that again. I if, you might, if you might be able to add um, to the slides that information about your boot camp for licensors, that's something that oh. we could share later after the webinar. That would be fine. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions about whether or not we can share some of these resources after the fact, and the answer is yes, we will do our best to share all of it. Great. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. I want to ask you one last question, um, Aliza. Um, mm -hmm. High level, we don't have a lot of time left, but for the people who might be watching this webinar who are thinking about trying to pursue something like this in their state, um, what's your best advice to them uh, as they embark on this kind of work? Um, I guess my best advice is uh, take care of yourself and your passion so that you don't burn out um, because it is a lot of work and like I said, um, you may be needing to do a lot of it for free or really like poking and prodding and continuing to advocate and continuing to be involved. Um, you know, you are setting up your state or country's system of education in a way that is trying to be, uh, you know, in a good relationship with the earth. Um, and that is not something that, uh, generally speaking is there so there's a lot of there's a lot of heart involved and it you know anytime your heart's really involved and you uh, get to setbacks it can feel really challenging um so just like look after your heart and um, stick with it yeah thank you so much Eliza, and thank you for putting so much of your heart into it and i know there are many more people across Washington State who have been putting their hearts into this for a very long time. Absolutely. Um, it's been such an incredible effort from a lot of people there. So we're so thankful to all of you. Again, um, I just want to mention that, uh, again, we will make um, these slides available um, to everyone who's been on this call. We'll send some follow-up um, with all those materials as much as we can. and. Um, this will also be posted to NAAW's YouTube um, channel, so you can go back and watch this uh, webinar at any time. You can share it with your friends, anyone who would like to see it. If they feel like they might find some information or inspiration there, it will be there. Um, and again, we'll share this PowerPoint with everyone and any other materials that Eliza um, is willing to share. And she could also potentially fill in a few other uh, answers to questions that we weren't able to get to today, because I know everyone has a lot. Um, and yeah, I'll I, try my yeah, best. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll understanding that um, it's a huge task, so we won't overburden you. Um, but I do encourage you also to um, subscribe to NAAW's YouTube channel um, so that you can see all of the great content there uh, around uh, environmental education for all sorts of audiences. Uh, with that, we reach three o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Aliza, for your time and all your great work and everyone in Washington. And um, hopefully we'll see you in Cincinnati this summer. Yeah, Thank hope you. to see you soon. Thank you, everyone.
Good luck.